Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a new series on the book of Ephesians. It's a short book, but it's got a lot of material in it. I think we'll have lots of things to talk about in this series of lessons. This first lesson for July 1 of 2023 is entitled Paul and the Ephesians. And we'd like to begin, as usual, with a word of prayer. A wonderful Father, as you look down on our day and compare with what you saw going on in Ephesus in the days of Paul, we wonder how you, compare, you would compare us. Lord, there was challenges that Paul struggled with in, in that city, as we'll see, uh, help us to know how we can meet some of those same kind of challenges in our day, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Paul had, a, or had a profound purpose that motivates his letter, partly because of his imprisonment. Remember that Paul was in prison when he wrote this letter. We'll talk more about that. And partly because of ongoing persecution and temptations. The Ephesians are, uh, are tempted to lose heart. Paul reminds them of what happened when they were converted, accepting Christ as their Savior and becoming part of the church. They have become Christ's body, Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 4, the building materials of, in a temple, Ephesians 2, the bride of Christ, Ephesians 5, and a well-equipped army, Ephesians 6. So now we've done the whole book. Well, I guess we skipped Ephesians 3. We'll get back to that. <laughs> They played a strategic role in the fulfilling God's grand plan to unite everything in Christ, Ephesians 1, 9, and 10. Paul writes to awaken the believers in Ephesus to their first, I'm sorry, to their full identity and privileges as followers of Christ. Writing, Paul is writing what we, what we believe was house arrest in Rome. He had had a one, at least one episode before Nero and apparently was released to probably what we would call house arrest. He was addressing a group of Christians scattered in various communities in Asia Minor. That would be mo modern Western Turkey. Ephesus had become the distribution center for the Christian churches. Now, why would we need a distribution center? Anybody have an idea? Why don't we just call it the, the publishing press was, that was there? <clears throat> yeah, except that there were no publishing they efforts, have, they no devices for doing yet. that. They were, the, all, the only way to do it was copy it by hand. And manuscripts were very, even papyrus manuscripts or even manuscripts <coughs> made out of, out of animal skins. <coughs> Paul had addressed his letter first to them. Paul had had lots of time to think while under, well under house arrest. So his vision of what was, what is involved in the great controversy had begun been massively expanded. Jim? From the Bible study guide, the first lesson for this quarter stretches, sketches the background to the study of the entire epistle to the Ephesians and focuses on several major themes. First, we learned about Paul's purpose in writing his epistle to the Ephesians. To help the Ephesians re remember, identify, excuse me, remember their identity and role in God's kingdom and his plans. Second, we get to know the Ephesians better. We virtually visit Ephesus, walk on its streets, listening to the people of the city talk and hearing their interest in magic and, other, and the other world. We watch hundreds of ships anchored in their port and we visit the impressive temple of Artemis while seeing people of all classes and ages rushing to their, excuse me, to join the riot in the amphitheater. Third, we study the literary structure of the epistle and thus form a panoramic view of the apostle's flow of thoughts and his main subjects. Fourth, we discover that Paul's all pervasive theme in his epistle to is threefold, Jesus Christ, his love for his church and his work through the church for the salvation of humanity. And its effect on the entire universe. So this is from the Bible study guide number 13. Okay, so we read some very interesting words in Ephesians 1, 
the last part of 8 and up through 10. Jennifer? Ephesians 1, 8b to 10. In all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had purposed and made known to us the secret plan he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth, with Christ as head. Very good, American Bible Society. Well, there's another passage that goes along with that, Gordon. Ephesians 3, 7 through 10, also from the Good News Bible. <clears throat> I was made a servant of the gospel by God's special gift, which he gave me through the working of his power. I am less than the least of all God's people. Was that true that yeah, Paul was the least? Would you think that Paul was the least, of, the least of all God's people? Go ahead. Yet God gave me this privilege of taking to the Gentiles the good news about the infinite riches of Christ and of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. God, <clears throat> who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages in order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. Okay, we could stop now and spend a bunch of time talking about why would God keep a secret and why is it now being revealed? Well, part of the answer is found in Colossians. Myra? Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. Through the Son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. God made peace through his Son's blood on the cross, noting his Son's sacrificial death, and so brought back to himself all things, both on earth and in heaven. Good News Bible. Wow, okay. Charles, from the writings of Ellen White, through the plan of salvation, a larger purpose is to be wrought out even than the salvation of man and the redemption of the earth. Through the revelation of the character of God in Christ, the beneficence of the divine government would be manifested before the universe. The charge of Satan refuted and the nature and results of sin made plain, <clears throat> and the perpetuity of the law fully demonstrated. It's Ellen White, Sons of the okay. Times. Okay. So, wow, we're seeing some very broad, very big plans going on here, don't we? Now, how, how could the plan of salvation possibly have a larger implication than to save me? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, unless you understand that the great controversy involves God's conflict with the devil and all the devil's misrepresentations and questions about God's character and how he runs his government. And if that doesn't get straightened out, if the, 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 the most blunt way to put this is if God were really like Satan he claims he is, would you even want to go to heaven? And of course the answer should be no. no. So Satan has claimed that God is arbitrary vengeful, severe, Un unforgiving, unforgiving yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for the, this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. What is the first thing mentioned? Vindicate the character of God before the universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligences of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, would draw all unto me. Now, many of you who are familiar with Scripture realize that in the King James Version, it says all men, and men is in italics. Why was the word men put in italics? Is that not for emphasis? It's not in the original language because it shouldn't be there. We read on. So Ellen White got it right, even though she didn't have... Yes. 
well, that see, information. But the Pacific Press or some people change it back. They tried to, in some of the more modern printings, they've tried to put it back in. Try that in Reflecting Christ, it has that. Yeah. Really? All men unto me, yeah. Mm. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe, it would justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. Wow. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and the results of sin. Patriarchs and Prophets 68 and 69. Of course, that's Ellen White as well. Well, now, coming back to our business of Ephesians here, in any communication, it is very important to not only to understand the situation of the author of the communication, but also to understand the situation of the person or group of persons to whom it was addressed. Here is what we know about the chronology of the book of Acts and some of Paul's relationship to the people of Ephesus. And if you look on our website, uh, that chronology is comes under uh, the tentative chronology of the book of Acts. We would be here for an hour or two or three if we tried to deal with that tonight, so we won't do that. But focusing on his work in Ephes at Ephesus, we see the tentative chronology of Paul's relationship to Ephesus based on our Bible study guide for Monday. Here's a very brief snippet from that. For a chronology of the life of Paul, see so forth we already mentioned. So here we see we have in AD 52, Paul's initial brief visit to Ephesus. And I might add, if you put together all the evidences available and you start with the book of Daniel and the prophecies were made about the time of Christ and then the 2300 day prophecy and so forth, and then you fit it together with the arrival of Jesus, his anointing, his crucifixion, the, the stoning of Stephen, and the spread, the, the dispersion, really, of the Christian church to all the nations in the Mediterranean area. And then you fit that with Paul's, the story of Paul's Gospels and the things that we can nail down exactly. And you find out if you carefully work that out, everything fits exactly. It is amazing, especially considering the fact that so many uh, commentaries, non-Adventist commentaries, say, well, none of these dates are very precise. We're not sure about this. We're not sure about that. But if you really do your homework, it's amazing. It really is amazing. So here we see that in AD 52, so Paul's, Paul's... Paul's ministry doesn't fit into that, does it? Absolutely. In what way? Well... Because it's not part of the 70 weeks. Uh, no, no, it fits in because if you take what I'm saying is if you take Paul from the book of Acts and you carefully put together Paul's work with all, everything, this, all, everything that we can date from the book of Acts and then you compare that with the prophecies from Daniel and later Revelation, it fits exactly. It just, just right on top. Up it, to the... Stoning of Stephen and the distribution of the gospel to no. the... No, no. What, what, what else after that? Oh, we know, we, we, we can date Paul's exact time in Corinth. We can, other but things... That was, was that part of the 70 weeks or the 2300 days? No, 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 no. I, I tried to tell you, I didn't say it was part of the 2300 days or the, the 2300 years or the, or the 490 years, but I'm saying that those dates, if you line them up with the dating we can do with Paul, they fit exactly. Fit exactly with, with Paul's. The, the, the calendar, the whole thing, fits exactly. It's not an overlap. It, 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 this one ends and that one starts exactly on the same date. No, right. The 490 years was over with stoning of Stephen. Yes. That's done. Exactly. It's written. And one closed. year later, right. Paul then was, starts the uh, second phase, perhaps, yeah, if we want right. to say, yeah. the, of the 2300 days. That one, day, one year later, Paul <laughs> was, uh, whatever you want, converted on the road to Damascus, mm -hmm. and then you can follow on his thing exactly. And, and it fits with, with the timing that you can, you can nail down for the Caesars that's available through Roman chronology. I mean, I, I, obviously... So the dates are available. The stuff, in other words... There is nothing, if you date it very carefully, there's nothing in conflict. Maybe I just put it that way. It, puts the, it fits together like a jigsaw puzzle. 
conf nothing in conflict with the second phase, if we want with to say, any of, of that I mean, 2300. Yeah, if you, you can start with the 2300 days and you go right on down through and it just fits. Um, I know it takes, yeah. I've spent a lot of time working mm -hmm. on that. And so obviously I don't have time to go through all of it with right, with right now, but it, and we could, you can nail down the people who were in Corinth, the guy, the guy who tried Paul, he was in Corinth exactly at the time when Paul was there. I mean, that kind of stuff. And the, pro, and the people who was in, in charge in, in Rome when Paul was there, that fits exactly. Or what Gordon is asking maybe is that <clears throat> it's, it fits in how the gospel was going to be preached, but this was not mentioned specifically it's, it's, in 2300 days. No, no, that's, it's I not specifically it's, mentioned in Daniel okay. or Revelation, right. but it fits. Exactly. With the, history. It with, fits with history. With history. Even though some history, they have tried to change it, you know, yeah. they have tried... Mm, yeah, lots of things, if you start reading... These start, things happen that verify that mm. what we know or what we thought we knew before is actually... True. True. Yep. So the critics would say, well, they're historical novels that ha have historical events and dates and superimpose uh, something else, you know. The, the, the critics would say, that's, that's just, it's just like a historical novel. You could, you, you could say what you want, I'm just saying. I, I'm just saying what the critics are gonna yeah, say. You're right. Well, and I, I, and I would say, okay, let's date it, let's figure it out exactly. Bang, 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 bang. Nothing, you, there's not one date in there that you can say, the Bible is wrong, this can't be the right date because the Bible says this, they all fit. So anyway, we, we can't spend the rest of the night talking about that. But it's that. interesting, though. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. So, okay. Okay, Paul's first visit was on his way home from Corinth, and that was AD 52. He came back to, to Ephesus and for three years, 53 to 56, um, and composed during that time, 1 Corinthians, near the end of his stay there. He, he later... Uh, on, on his way after spending some time back at Corinth, he visited Miletus and he said, he told the people there that this is my last time, I will not see you again. And finally in AD 62, he composed this letter to the Ephesians, probably just, just near the end of his confinement in Rome the first time. Okay, so let's see, who's next here? Jim, is that you? The Bible study guide. Ephesus was one of the largest cities of the Roman Empire, with a population of about 250,000. Only Rome, Antioch in Syria, and Alexandria in Egypt were larger. It was the capital of one of the empire's richest provinces, the province of Asia, which covered much of what we know today as Asia Minor, that is Western Turkey. In Paul's day, the province was enjoying a time of growth and prosperity, a port city. Ephesus was also at the crossroads of important land routes. While the people worshiped many deities to this, can you, well, worshiped many deities in the city, Artemis, regarded as the protector goddess of the city, was supreme. Her worship was focused, can you, was the focus of civic ceremonies, athletic games and annual celebrations. Artemis was called Diana by the Romans. See Acts 19, 24, and 35, the Bible City Guide. So having finished a year and a half building up the church and founding really the church in Corinth, on his way back to Jerusalem, he had planned to be there in time for Passover. He, um, via his home church in Antioch in Syria, Paul stopped briefly at Ephesus, spoke with the Jews there, and left Aquila and Priscilla that he had worked with in Corinth to carry on the work until he had a chance to return. Later he returned and spent three years with the Ephesians and the other churches in Asia Minor. Now, there are a number of, well, if you look at Romans 2, I'm sorry, not Romans, Revelation 2 through 4, 3, you see the seven churches mentioned there, and all those churches are fairly close to each other. They're not far away. And they're all in Turkey. Yeah, they're all in Turkey, yes. Um, 
Ephesus was a huge religious center for followers of Artemis slash Diana, whose temple there was four times as large as the Parthenon in Athens. I mean, okay. that's an enormous building. This is four times as big as that. Acts 19 verses 1 to 12 point out that Paul and his associates had an enormous impact on the people in Ephesus. There were people in Ephesus claiming to be exorcists, casting demons out of people. And I could just tell you without going into a lot of detail, we'll, we'll see more as we move along. <clears throat> that temple was huge and everything, every kind of despicable thing you can possibly imagine went on there. There were banks inside of their thing, in the, inside of that temple. There was people casting out devils there. There was fertility cult religion going on there. It was, it was just amazing. So, Jennifer, can you read for us Acts 19 there? Acts 19, verse 13 through 20. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying... And interrupt for just a second. Jewish exorcists? Jewish exorcists. <laughs> Why are Jews doing this kind of stuff? Anyway, go ahead. Um, I, the evil spirits saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Skaviva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Quote, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I recognize, but who are you? <laughs> and the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Now, awesome. let me interrupt for a second again. Yeah. How many people did they say lived in Ephesus? 250,000. 250, That's as big as San Bernardino or Riverside and so forth. And something like this happens and everybody knows about it? Mm. Wow. I have a quick question. This is seven sons of a high priest of all things. Well, I, the reason it says high priest, I, I've wondered about that too. He apparently was a uh, descendant of Aaron. Okay. Mm. But not necessarily, because there was not, only not the one, one high priest. Not the one in Jerusalem, no. Right. No. Okay. Okay. Yes. And fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Wow. The English Standard Version. That's so this just... Is the same uh, piece of silver that's a day's wage for a laborer. We're going to read about that in just a moment. Okay. The burning of books has occurred through history in a number of different settings. Mm. So what's going on here? Gordon? From the Bible Study Guide, contemporary intellectuals such in as... In our day, the contemporary in our day, go ahead. Such as Rebecca Newth, former chairwoman of the Library and Information Science Program at the University of Hawaii, in her Burning Books and Leveling Libraries, Extremist Violence and Cultural Destruction, with the author, with the uh, publisher given, concludes that book burning constitutes the destruction of human cultural heritage. In his Burning the Books, A History of the Deliberate Destruction of Knowledge, in the reference given, uh, Richard Overden, director of the Bodleian Libraries of the University of Oxford, I don't know if it's really Bodleian, but argues that humanity must reject book burning and preserve human knowledge and culture. The burning of mostly Jewish books by the Nazis in 1933, or the destruction of Western capitalist leaning, leaning books by Mao Zedong's Red Guard in 1966 are used as classic examples of book burning with a political purpose of controlling the population's access to information and imposing a new culture 
ideology, historical interpretation, and worldview. <clears throat> the story of insurgents who burned thousands of ancient African manuscripts in Timbuktu in 2013 is used as an example of indiscriminate extremist religious book burning. During that time, a few Christian pastors from various denominations were condemned as bigots or intolerant when they conducted book burning services, calling for witchcraft books to be burned. That's from the Teacher's Bible Study Guide, page 15. Okay, so was this a cultural demolition going on in Ephesus? How should we understand the book burning described in Acts 19.19? Several points should be noted. Myra? Okay, this book burning was a voluntary act of those who had converted to Christianity from paganism and magic. They did not destroy the libraries and the properties of other people, but they burned their own books of witchcraft, books they themselves had used in practicing their pagan religions. By this voluntary act, they publicly proclaimed that once they received the call of Jesus Christ to join his kingdom, they were cutting themselves off from their sinful past. They did not want to have anything further to do with Satan and his demonic activities. Okay, okay. let me just interrupt for a second. So they could have sold those books, I'm sure, for a lot of money. Yes. But if you sell them, what are you doing? You're propagating, propagating paganism, aren't you? Right, right. Okay. 250 years later, the Emperor Dios, Diocletian. Diocletian, okay, ordered all Christians to bring their sacred books to be burned if they wanted to avoid being burned themselves. Some Christians, Christians complied and handed their scriptures over to the Roman authorities to be burned. Those Christians were called traitors or those who handed over their books. Other Christians, however, preferred to be burned themselves rather than to betray or renounce the word of God. Thus, while book burning in Acts 19 was a voluntary and joyous proclamation of liberation from the snares of sin and Satan, Diocletian's book burning, book burning was a violent and oppressive political and ideologic persecution persecution of Christianity with the purpose of annihilating people, the people of God, and imposing the pagan religion it's from the Adult Bible Study Guide. So there's a very different difference here. This, the Ephesus Bible uh, burning was not a Bible burning. It was, okay, we have these evil books, these evil, they were scrolls, they weren't books as we know them today. We have these scrolls that contain a lot of evil stuff that we don't want to be in anybody's hands. We're going to burn them, completely destroy them, and worth a lot of money, worth a lot of money. And these other cases that it's talking about, this is an authoritarian source trying to force people, try to eliminate their culture, try to do whatever and get rid of them in one way or another. Very different situation. We're looking about 250 AD now, about there. Little less than 380. Yeah, Diocletian. Diocletian was around 300. 300. So we, you see, this is perhaps the climactic events going on in pagan Rome. Yes. That very quickly goes over to papal Rome, which takes a nasty turn. Yes. In hurting God's people. Yep. Paul was anxious that his converts to Christianity continue to grow in their spiritual lives. And I'm going to ask a question now, and I'm going to ask it again later. How would it affect your church if your pastor was in prison? Assuming he was in prison because of his Christianity. Think about that. We'll, we'll come back to it. Charles? Ephesians 4, 1 to 16. I urge you then... I, who am a prisoner because I serve the Lord, live a life that measures up to the standard God set when He called you. Wow. We always be always humble, gentle, and patient. Show your love by being tolerant with one another. Do your best 
to preserve the unity which the Spirit gives you, means of the peace that binds you together. There is one body and one Spirit, just as there is one hope to which God has called you. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is one God and Father of all, who is Lord of all, works through all, and is in all. I'll go ahead, I'll pick that up there. Sure. Each one of us has received a special gift in proportion to what Christ has given. As the scripture says, when he went up to the very heights, he took many captives with him. He gave gifts to people. It was he who gave gifts. Uh, he appointed some to be apostles, others to be prophets, others to be evangelists, others to be pastors and teachers. Now I'm gonna ask a question. What kind of gifts are those? Gifts of the is it something you wrap up in cellophane paper? Uh -huh. and it's talents. Uh, these are talents. These are abilities. He did this to prepare all God's prop people for the work of Christian service in order to build up the body of Christ. And so we shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. Um, we shall come, become mature people, reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature, and again, I'm going to interrupt here. Uh, there are a lot of Christians who think that the ultimate Christianity is be like, in, in light based of a misunderstanding of Christ's statement about the child. If you want to be a real Christian, be like this child. Well, what's the, what is the main aspect, the most important aspect of a small child? His capacity to grow. Yeah. Every way, mentally, physically, spiritually, socially. So... Paul, Jesus wasn't saying stay a child. He's saying become like a child so you can grow. And so we, we shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and our knowledge of the Son of God. We shall become mature people, reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. Then we shall no longer be children carried by the waves and blown about by every shifting wind of the teaching of deceitful people who lead others who, uh, into error by the tricks they invent. Instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ, who is the head. Under his control, all the different parts of the body fit together, and the whole body is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So when each separate part works as it should, the whole body grows and builds itself up through love. So, Paul called for the Christians in Ephesus to meet together, to help each other and to grow in their Christianity so they would not be tossed about like children carried by the wind and waves and blown about by restricting, restricting wind of the teaching of deceitful people. Um, Tim, you want to take on Ephesians 2 there? Uh, verses 19 to 22. Then so you Gentiles are not foreigners or strangers any longer. You are now fellow, fellow citizens with God's people and members of the family of God. You, too, are built upon the foundation laid by the apostles and prophets, the cornerstone being Christ Jesus himself. <laughs> he is the one who holds the whole building together and makes it grow into a sacred temple dedicated to the Lord. In union with him, you, too, are being built together with all of others into a place where God lives through his spirit, Good News Bible. Okay, so what is Paul saying? He says, some of you maybe used to be Jews, some of you used to be pagans and so forth, but as Christians, Christ is our single head. We're all building up, being built up like blocks in a, in, in, in a sacred temple. Paul was calling for a church, including Jews and Gentiles, to be built up with Jesus Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. But you can be sure that the devil is not asleep as he saw the progress that Paul and his associates were making. Jennifer? Acts 19, verse 21 through 20. After these things had happened, Paul made up his mind to travel through Macedonia and Achaia and go, to, go on to Jerusalem. After I go there, he said, I must also see Rome. So he sent Timothy and Erastus, two of his helpers, to Macedonia, while he spent more time in the province of Asia. It was at this time that there was serious trouble in Ephesus because of the way of the Lord. 
a certain silversmith named Demetrius made silver models of the temple of the goddess Artemis, and his business brought a great deal of profit to the workers. So he called them all together with others whose work was like theirs and said to them, Men, you know that our prosperity comes from this work. Now you can see and hear for yourselves that this fellow Paul is doing. What this fellow Paul is doing. He says that gods made by human hands are not gods at all, and he has succeeded in convincing many people, both here in Ephesus and in nearly the whole province of Asia. Let me interrupt for a second. Try to imagine yourself in a city with 250,000 people from all over the world, people speaking different languages. It's a great cultural center. There's, trans there's uh, shipping going in and out all the time. And one man shows up, and in a short time, he's having this kind of impact on the city. That's amazing. Yeah. Just amazing. Okay? There is the danger, then, that this business of ours will get a bad name. Not only that, but there is also the danger that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will come to mean nothing and that her greatness will be destroyed. The goddess worshipped by everyone in Asia and in all the world. As the crowd heard these words, they became furious and started shouting, Great is Artemis of Ephesus! The uproar spread throughout the whole city. The mob seized Gaius and Arist Aristarchus, two Macedonians who were traveling with Paul, and rushed with them to the theater. Paul himself wanted to go before the crowd, but the believers would not let him. Let me interrupt for just a second. That enormous theater is still there. Mm. I've been there a couple of times. So uh, and I. Yeah. And it has a stage three levels high. So you could have something going on up here, then something going on here and there. And so instead of like today, we would switch cameras and we would see different things. They could have things going on like that. So while people are getting ready up here, something else is going on here. And it's, a, of course, a perfect parabola. So the a person, even with an just ordinary speech, you would be able to hear them way up. Um, I didn't think I was going to have time to climb all the way to the top, but I managed to do it. Uh, clear up there at the back. This is an, and it's almost intact even today. Wow. Okay, so some of the provincial authorities who were his friends also sent him a message begging him not to show himself in the theater. Meanwhile, the whole meeting was in an uproar. Some people were shouting one thing, others were shouting something else, because most of them did not even know why they had come together. <laughs> That's, I mean, this is a typical riot. Yeah. Yes, a typical wow. riot. <laughs> Some of the people concluded that Alexander was responsible since the Jews made him go up to the front. Then Alexander motioned with his hand for the people to be silent, and he tried to make a speech of, def def of defense. Yeah. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, they all shouted together the same thing for two hours. Great is Artemis of Ephesus. At last, the town clerk was able to calm the crowd. Fellow Ephesians, he said, everyone knows that the city of Ephesus is the keeper of the temple of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell down from heaven. Nobody can deny these things. So then, you must calm down and not do anything reckless. You have brought these men here even though they have not robbed temples or said evil things about our goddess. If Demetrius and his workers have an accusation against anyone, we have the authorities and the regular days for court. Charges can be made there. But if there is something more that you want, it will have to be settled in a legal meeting of citizens. Wow. <laughs> For after what has happened today, there is the danger that we all, that we will be accused of a riot. Mm. There is no excuse for all this uproar, and we would not be able to give a good reason for it. After saying this, he dismissed the meeting. After the uproar died down, Paul called together the believers and with words of encouragement said goodbye to them. Then he left and went on to Macedonia, the Good News Bible. Okay. So was that a mostly peaceful crowd? Maybe to start out, <laughs> but it wasn't, it wasn't peaceful by mostly the time they got done. peaceful riot. People yeah. go mad rapidly in crowds and return to their senses slowly. One by one. One by one. Yep. Yep. So this is craziness. By the way, do you know how much is left of that magnificent temple? 
There's a fair oh. amount left. Lots of, lots of pillars that they've put back up. No, there's one pillar. One pillar is left of the Temple of, the, of Artemis. And it's not even all consistent. It's probably pieces of two or three pillars. And there's a bird nest on top. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. What's happened is they have taken the pillars and almost all the stuff from that. Most of it has gone to be used in building up a mosque. And then some of it has been used to build other buildings that are higher up on the hill above it. There's one pillar left in the, in the Temple of Artemis. I guess they had a... They, had the they, they stopped with a reproduction oh, yeah. picture of it. I, that's what it was. Well, if you, and if you want to get an idea what it's like, there's a model of it just outside of Istanbul. There's a, on a hill, uh, uh, I think one quarter size model or something is still huge. That has, and we're going to read more about it later. But anyway, mm -hmm. do, do we see do we see such direct conflicts going on in our day? Paul trying to introduce the truth of Scripture and the truth about Jesus Christ was in direct opposition to those practicing witchcraft and idolatry and fertility cult religions in connection with the Temple of Artemis. I mean, that's just about as close as the great controversy as you can get, right? After Paul had that episode with the silversmiths, he felt it was necessary to leave Ephesus. He traveled to Macedonia and down to Corinth, where he needed to do some follow-up work. And uh, while he was in Ephesus, we're not, this is not our subject for this time, but he found out there were problems over in Corinth. He apparently took a, bo a boat quickly from Ephesus to Corinth. You could do that quite easily. And they were very rude to him. And he went back to Ephesus and he wrote a very strong letter, which I think you can find in uh, 2 Corinthians 10 to 13. And then they found, he said, I guess we were in the wrong. We probably better <laughs> invite Paul back. And, and he, now he's going there to do that. He traveled out Macedonia and down to Corinth where he needed to do some follow-up work. From Corinth, he planned to take a boat in, 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 to Antioch in Syria and then travel down to Jerusalem. Just before getting on the boat, he found out that some people had boarded the boat with intention to kill him after he got on the ship. That was in Corinth. Mm -hmm. So he walked around to Asia Minor, got onto a boat, and was able to reach Jerusalem in time for Pentecost. He wanted to be there for Passover, but he got there in time for Pentecost. Um, before yeah. you, can just if you can make a comment, um, Paul was keeping the uh, Passover, therefore... Well, okay, now think about this. You're a Christian who's trying to spread the Christian message to Jews and Gentiles, right? Okay, where would you go if you wanted to see thousands, even millions of Jews gathered in one place? Jerusalem. Sure, of course. So it was really, I mean, I wish it was worded a little better, but we yeah. cannot. But yeah. he says he wanted to go there in Jerusalem during Passover, so. Yeah. Are you going to blame yeah. the Holy Spirit for not wording no, it No, no, the wording. Uh, well, we don't believe in the word inspiration. It's, it's very interesting uh, because if you look at that story very carefully, Paul says, I was told by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem. But in two different places, on his way to Jerusalem, quote, prophets told him, don't go there because you're going to be arrested and all these things are going to happen to you. And Paul says, why are you bothering me? I'm ready to die. Mm. So he had conflicting messages, somehow or other. Mm. Okay. There's considerable evidence that Paul was trying to, to teach, uh, to touch all bases in establishing firm churches in the city of Ephesus and in the surrounding territories. From the Bible Study Guide, Paul's witness in the large, sophisticated city of Ephesus was so effective that it impacted an important ec economic engine for the city, tourism, focused on the Temple of Artemis. And what a temple it was. Now here's we have the information about the temple. This magnificent structure was composed partly of 127 pillars, each 60 feet high, of Parian marble, a pure white, flawless marble, highly prized for sculptures. Let me interrupt again for a second. Okay, <laughs> we're talking New Testament times, okay? How are you gonna, how are you gonna 
transport a pillar that's six feet in diameter, 60 feet long, with no mechanical help. Call in a helicopter. <laughs> How many helicopters? People. <laughs> Uh, I had the privilege, we, we were traveling one of the back roads there and with a guide that was from the local area, a guy who's a Christian, even though he, he says, are you a Christian or a Muslim? Well, he said, when I was born, they stopped Muslim in my passport because he's Turkish. Mm. <laughs> yeah, he, you, every Muslim gets Tur Muslim stamped in their passport. Every right there. Turkish gets... Anyway, so we were driving this little back road and he said, stop. He told the driver, pull over, stop. And we walked up over a little, tiny little path up over a hill and down over the other side. And here was the quarry. And they were making, it wasn't the same stuff. It was granite here, which is even harder than, than the marble. And here were several of these huge pillars lying out there on the ground. They've been sitting there for 2,000 years. They're still in good shape. And you could see exactly where they had cut them out of the mountain. And I mean, it's complete. I mean, you, you can't even imagine how they moved the things. Mm. Anyway. Can't imagine how they cut them out either. Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, I mean, nicely rounded. How about Solomon's temple? Yeah. Even earlier. Okay. So of the 127 pillars, 36 of these pillars were sculptured and overlaid with gold earning the template's reputation as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. That's Bible study guide for Monday. Mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. Notice what Paul was doing during those three years in Ephesus, Myra? Acts 19, verses 1 to 12. And it happened that while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no. We have not even heard that the, there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, unto what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the same name. In the name of? Yes. Um, in the name of Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on, him, on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. And there, about 12 of them, 12 men in all, mm -hmm. English Okay. Version. Now, I'm going to ask you another question. Is that what happened to the people at Pentecost and to the group at the home of Cornelius? That's mm -hmm. the same wording. Mm -hmm. And what do we know about those occasions? Well, there are people from all over the world. Okay, you want to read what Ellen White said about that? Sure. There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven, during the dispersion, of the Jews has been scattered to almost every part of the inhabited world. And in their exile, they had learned to speak various languages. Many of these Jews were on this uh, occasion in Jerusalem. This is talking about Pentecost. Now. This Pentecost, right. Attending their religious festivals, festivals, then in progress. Every known tongue was represented by these assembled. These Diversity of languages would have been a great hindrance to the proclamation of the gospel. God, therefore, in a miraculous manner, supplied the deficiency of the apostles. The Holy Spirit did for them that which they could not have uh, accomplished for themselves in a lifetime. They could now proclaim the truths of the gospel uh, abroad, speaking with accuracy the languages of those for whom they were laboring. This miraculous gift was a strong evidence to the world that their commission bore the signet of heaven. Uh, from the time forth, the language of the disciples was pure, simple, accurate, whether they spoke in their native tongue 
or in a foreign language. Wow. Really, truly wow. Acts of the Apostles 39 and 40. So when it says the Holy Spirit was poured out on them and they spoke in languages, here's another case where it says the same thing. Cornelius and his family, it said the same thing. Does it mean these people actually were given the gift of going out and, and spreading the gospel with that fantastic ability? Unfortunately, as we know already, Paul was arrested in Jerusalem and had to be protected by the Roman government and taken to Caesarea Maritima, where he remained in prison for two years. Then he appealed to Rome when, he, when his case came up before the judge. Then he had that journey on the boat that ended in a disaster outside the island of Malta. The next spring, they got a new boat and traveled to Rome after having had a brief a trial, he apparently was allowed to stay in a home that he paid for himself while under house arrest. It is from there that he wrote the books of Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. And some people believe that he also wrote the book of Hebrews mm -hmm. during that time. How do you think he paid for it himself? What kind of work do you think? That's a good question. I'm a, he talks about the generous gifts that the Philippians sent to him. So maybe it was with that money. We just don't know. Okay. He don't was know. a pediatrician. <laughs> no. Um, no, but uh, seriously, he was a tent maker also. Yeah. He but worked. it's a little hard to make a tent while you're chained to a That's Roman true. soldier. That's he had to have come from a rich family to yeah. have gone and studied in Jerusalem. Yes. As he did. Yes. As a young man. But, uh, you know, this was a firebrand. And I think people who had... Uh, funds where he went and worked, I think they were generous. They, they, I think there were people who were supporting him, I'm sure. Yes. 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 Let's now take a quick look at the themes in the book of Ephesians. Um, what themes echo through the letter as a whole? There's an opening greeting. There's an introductory blessing. There's a prayer for the believers to receive Christ-focused wisdom. You can see the references there. Once spiritually dead, now ex ex exalted with Christ. He talks a lot about that. Christ's creation of the church out of Jews and Gentiles. So he, he's saying Christ is bringing people of all sorts of different backgrounds and bringing them together. Paul is preacher of Christ to the Gentiles, praying for believers to experience the love of Christ. Hold on to the spirit-inspired unity of the church. That's a very interesting chapter in Ephesians 4. Live the new unity nurturing life. Walk in love, light, and wisdom, chapter 5. Practice Christ shaped life in the Christian, Christian household. Stand together, the church is the army of God. And then closing comments. So, what key themes seem to have come through in this letter? What does it say to you, and what specific points or points, uh, or, or po point or points touch home? What do you see in those just very brief sketches? What about unity? Yes. 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 Like that. yes. yes. And he talks about bringing varied groups together, doesn't he? Yes. Mm -hmm. And he says that they're brought together with the guidance of God to the Holy Spirit. One of the interesting notions that we could easily overlook is the, is the fact that Paul was writing to a group of people, few of whom were able to read. So he recognized that this letter would be read by someone standing in front of each church group. How do you suppose this was actually carried out? Did the reader just read straight through the book? How much would you be able to comprehend if you heard the book read one time? Mm -hmm. Tychicus was the one who had carried the book from Paul to the Ephesians. Was he allowed time to explain as, as they read? Or did they get together on, in small groups later to discuss different questions that had arisen? Or both? Paul had some very important things to say about marriage, about children, even about slaves in this book. While some modern-day skeptics still question whether Paul, Paul could have written the book of Ephesians, virtually all conservative scholars agreed that he was the author. In Ephesians 1.1 and 3.1, Paul identified himself as the author. So now my question that you asked, I asked you earlier, when a church's spiritual leader is imprisoned, what effect do you think it might have on the congregation as a whole? 
Would we all run? To me, the most ideal would be that he will have prepared every, everyone so well that they could continue with the same spirit. That's surely all the way it ought to be, right? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Well, look at what happened in the case of Stephen. He was stoned. He was one of the leaders. He was one of the, uh, you know, deacons, and boom. He was stoned and the Christian, they started persecution, persecuting Christians. What did the Christians do? They just scattered, mm -hmm. carried the gospel everywhere. Jim. Well, the Bible study guide. In the church of which we are a part, Seventh-day Adventist Church, God is drawing together a transnational, multilingual, multiracial, cross-cultural community, Revelation 14, 6 and 7 that points the way to the fulfillment of his plan to unite all things in Jesus, Ephesians 1, 9, and 10. How can we work in concert with God's plan? From the Bible Study Guide for June 29. And I stop, and as I, as I struggle with these lessons, and I think about them, and I try to figure out exactly what we need to say about each one of these lessons, I think about my friends in Africa with almost no education. What are they going to do with these lessons? How much will they understand? And where's the majority of our church membership? It's now in Africa, Asia, and South America. I think there was a very important point made before about when the Holy Spirit was brought upon yeah. them, they spoke in simple words. And I think we forget the simplicity that yep. can be spoken. Okay, we've got about a minute left. Do you want to read some of that for us, Jennifer? Sure. This, from the Bible study guide, the story of the exorcist misusing the names of Jesus and Paul from Acts 19, 13 through 20 helps explain why Paul uses so much language about power in Ephesians. Some new believers under fresh conviction of the sovereignty of Jesus throw their expensive magic manuals into the flames. Thanks to the discovery of some 250 papyri dealing with magic, as well as other finds, we have ample illustrations of rituals, spells, formulas, curses, etc., similar to those likely featured in these manuals of magic. The volumes had advised believers how to conduct such rituals to persuade gods, goddesses, and spirit powers to okay, do whatever I, they would ask. Okay, I'm going to interrupt now because we're coming to an end of our time. This is an incredibly powerful book. We need to study it. We need to read it carefully and try to imagine what was going on in Ephesus, try to imagine Paul's life as well. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of reviewing this material, uh, many parts of it which were uh, first written thousands of years ago. Help us to understand it to the best of our ability as, as, under the guidance of your Holy Spirit is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.